Do your family dinners always end in a discussion? I'll tell you why that may be a good thing and why this is useful. What's the point of arguing? This is the University of the Netherlands. It probably happened to you many times in your life that you found yourself involved in an argument or discussion. And by this I mean that you were exchanging reasons for and against the position with somebody else. Did you enjoy the experience? Was it fruitful? Or did you come out of it empty-handed and tired? I'm a philosopher and I'm here to tell you why we argue, what we can get out of it, and about three different obligations of argumentation. Perhaps arguing for you is just a thing you do from time to time in your life without thinking too much about it. But scholars in many different disciplines spend quite some time thinking about argumentation. They often define argumentation as the communicative activity of producing and exchanging reasons in order to support, defend, or challenge claims and positions. This happens especially in situations of doubt or disagreement. Most of the conversations that take place in our daily lives are not really instances of argumentation. Still, argumentation is very important in a number of domains, such as in science, in the law, in politics, and also for education. In the literature on argumentation, there are three main applications that are discussed. To gain and exchange knowledge, to reach consensus, and to manage conflict. I'll talk about each of them now. Let's start with argumentation to gain and exchange knowledge. Many authors think that this is actually the main purpose of argumentation. One of them is John Stuart Mill, who's an influential philosopher from the 19th century. Mill thought that argumentation, arguing with somebody who disagrees with you, is the best way to improve your own knowledge of things. His thought is that when your positions and ideas are challenged by somebody who disagrees with you, you need to offer reasons to defend your positions. And by doing this, you need to think about your own positions more critically. And by doing this, argumentation would help you to get rid, rid of weak beliefs, poorly justified beliefs, and replace them with better, stronger beliefs. As Hume puts it, man is capable of rectifying his mistakes by discussing and by experience, not by experience alone. There must be discussion to show how experience is to be interpreted. Let me give you a concrete example. Suppose you want to improve your knowledge of economics. One thing you can do is start a discussion with somebody who's at least a little bit knowledgeable on the topic and somebody who disagrees with you to some extent. So for example, maybe you're in favor of high taxation and this other person is against. And the idea is that by exchanging reasons with one another, you both learn more about the topic. And the interesting thing in this case is that the loser of the argument, that is, the person who changes their mind after the discussion, is actually also the winner, because that person is the person who got something, who learned something from the interaction, and so got something out of it. So, so far this sounds very good, but the problem is that argumentation used as a way to gain and exchange knowledge only works in quite specific circumstances. One of them is that the positions being defended should be sufficiently different from each other. Another one is that you should trust the person you're discussing with to be sufficiently competent on the topic you're discussing. And finally, you need to trust that the person is not trying to fool you or take advantage from you. One example where things go wrong in this respect are the debates around vaccination. It is well known by now that scientific arguments don't really work to convince people who have vaccine hesitancy. And why is that? Well, because these people already distrust the scientific establishment and what they call Big Pharma. So they see these scientific arguments as, a, as an attempt of manipulating their beliefs with unreliable information. Now I move to the second application, the argumentation to reach consensus. The thought here is that humans often need to coordinate for action. And this applies to very mundane activities, such as planning what to do with friends on a Saturday evening, but also to complex situations, for example, political decision-making in a democracy. And the thought would be that argumentation is a good way to solve differences of opinions because people are exchanging reasons with one another, and by doing this, the opinions would come closer together. 
But in practice, this is often not what happens. In practice, what often happens is what uh, scholars describe as polarization. And that is when people are quite far from each other in terms of their opinions when they, before they argue, and after arguing, they end up even further apart in terms of these opinions. And so it seems that argumentation leads to consensus only under certain special circumstances. And these are that the opinions have to be a little bit different, but not too different. And more importantly, perhaps, that the people involved see themselves as cooperating towards a common goal, rather than pursuing conflicting interests. So let me give you a, a simple example again. Imagine that you're planning a vacation together with friends. You have the same goal, namely to have a good time together. And also, it's easier if your starting points are quite similar. For example, say you all agree you should go to Spain, but you only disagree on where in Spain you should go to. In cases like this, argumentation may well help you to reach a consensus. But when you don't have this alignment of interests, then more likely uh, argumentation will lead to a consensus that might not be good for everyone. So either it does not lead to consensus, it leads to polarization, or it leads to a consensus which is actually only beneficial for one of the parties involved. An example of this would be, say, if you're having a discussion with, with, your, with your colleagues at work on distributing some tasks that need to be done. Well, uh, it's quite likely that the opinion of the boss will end up prevailing because others may not dare to speak up, right? Because, of course, they're less powerful in this situation. In fact, a focus on consensus may even help the status quo of inequality because those with more power can force the others to concede and compromise. And now I quote argumentation scholar Jane Goodwin, and she says, in an unjust society, what purports to be a cooperative exchange of reasons really perpetuates patterns of oppression. So in these situations of conflicting interests, aiming at consensus may in fact be quite problematic. And that leads, of course, straight to, my, to the third application of argumentation, namely, as a response to conflict. When there is conflict, the usual options are to fight, to flee, or something in between. Argumentation will be one of those in-between responses to con conflict. It would be a constructive response in that it would help manage and de-escalate conflict. Here I quote philosopher Scott Aiken, who says, argument is a form of pacifism. We are, we are using words instead of swords to settle our disputes. But argumentation, in practice, if you look around you, often it seems to take the shape of real competitions, where people are really trying to crush the opponent, score points, and overpower the person that they're discussing with. So yes, it's true that argumentation can quite easily become a battle of wits, and it can even exacerbate existing conflict. But giving up on argumentation completely does not seem to be a very good idea either. An example of that would be uh, the, what happened in Washington at the beginning of 2021 when the Capitol was invaded by violent mobs of Trump supporters. What they were doing there was resorting to force and rejecting the usual ways to go about conflict, to manage conflict in a democracy, that is by deliberation and argumentation. What we conclude from this is that apparently we still need argumentation after all. And here I want to quote a political thinker, Chantal Mouffe, who says, what is important is that conflict does not take the form of an antagonism, which is a struggle between enemies, but the form of agonism, which is a struggle between adversaries. What's the difference here? Well, an enemy is somebody you want to crush by all means, and an adversary is an opponent that you respect. Argumentation would be one among many strategies to turn antagonism into agonism. It would be actually a bit like martial arts. It would be a way to channel and shape conflict into something constructive. And usually this requires quite clear rules of engagement. I now move to some concluding thoughts. We started with the question, what's the point of arguing? We then discussed three main applications of argumentation to gain and exchange knowledge, to reach consensus, and to manage conflict. We see that for all three of them, 
things can go wrong if the circumstances are not good, if they're not ideal. So maybe by now you're thinking, well, argumentation is not very useful after all, because it only works in quite specific situations. And when the circumstances are not ideal, often what you get is the opposite of what you want. For example, polarization instead of consensus. So it, looks, it doesn't look very good, but it's not as bad as it sounds because argumentation does work quite well in a number of domains of human activity, for example, in science. Moreover, giving up on argumentation completely doesn't seem to be a good, attractive option either. And here I'm reminded of a very famous remark by Winston Churchill, who said, democracy is the worst form of government except for all those other forms that have been tried from time to time. That sounds pretty grim. But I guess the conclusion to be drawn here is that argumentation is far from perfect, but not arguing at all is even worse. What we should do, I think, is reflect on the limits and the risks involved in argumentation and when, on when argumentation is a suitable re a response to conflict and disagreement or not. And here, I think, uh, in this respect, this cartoon illustrates very well the point that it's not always a good idea to argue with everyone who's wrong on the internet. With this lecture, I've tried to give you some elements to reflect on these difficult but important questions. And now, it's your turn to draw your own conclusions. Thank you for watching.